guys. We're back. It's another episode of the Fearless Pursuit of Freedom podcast. And today's guest is a good buddy of mine out of Richmond, Virginia. Chris Jefferson, man. Appreciate you coming on. Let's talk business. So you are you go, man. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. So you're you're real estate like me. You're a little step above me. So I would like to dive into your business, see what you what you're doing and and uh, why you chose real estate. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, I chose real estate, man, ultimately because uh, as a kid, I was always reading uh, like Forbes and Fortune magazine and stuff like that. Really? And before the whole tech world uh, kind of came in, you know, I felt like every time I opened a magazine, I used to love those uh, was it the wealth list, right? They come out each year. Yeah. So I'd read it, and, and I swear, like you know, it'd, it'd say what industry the person was in, and then kind of below that, it would say uh, like what other investments they had. And either everybody was either in real estate or all their sub investments were all real estate. So as a kid, I kind of had in my head that I wanted to to be in real estate. My mom's a banker, uh, my dad's an engineer, um, so it kind of felt like a uh, like a natural uh, step. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and that's kind of almost why I got into it. I mean, I for some reason had this weird thing with. Um, the design of houses since I was a kid, I used to make houses out of popsicle sticks, but same deal. Oh, nice. Yeah. When I would, uh, see these lists of the top, you know, wealthiest people in the country and the world, it was all you know, 90% of them were all in real estate or some form or fashion. Um, exactly. Man. So, uh, you're a youngster. Um, how long have you been in real estate? Man, long time. I've been in, uh, I've been doing it myself for 10 years. I got into it right out of high school. So I'm 32. I uh, started my business uh, myself when I was 22. Prior to that, man, I did a bunch of stuff. But ultimately, in a nutshell, uh, I wanted to get into real estate, wanted to figure it out. I was dating this girl at the time, and her mom retired in her 40s. And uh, she did it through rental property. So I asked her about that. She introduced me to somebody who owned a mortgage company. I uh, kind of started following him around. I used to work overnight at FedEx. I didn't go to college. Uh, well, I dropped out of college. You know, I was going to uh, where I was working overnight at FedEx loading tractor trailers, man, which is like uh, really, really work. Yeah. And uh, I used to go hang, hang out at this guy's office when I got off every morning. I realized I didn't want to be on the finance side of the business. It didn't seem like you could make enough money. And uh, one day I was leaving church. Saw a uh, We Buy Houses sign on a telephone call, a bandit sign. I didn't know what a bandit sign was at the time, but I saw a bandit sign. Called the number, a guy picked up. Turns out that I played ball in school with his kids. So we kind of became really cool. He kind of started mentoring me. And uh, things just kind of naturally started happening from there, man. Uh, the market bottomed out a couple years after that. And once the market bottomed out, you know, I was, I was in school. I dropped out. I, was, I think I was able to just see that there was a real wealth opportunity there. And uh, if I was ever going to do something, uh, then it was the time to do it. So I dropped out to do real estate. And then uh, a couple months later, I found out I was having a kid. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it turned out to be a really good call, uh, thankfully. Um, not without the turtles and struggles, but ended up working itself out for sure. Yeah, awesome. Man, that's weird. Off a of bandit side, you got a mentor. That's crazy. Never heard that one yet. Absolutely, man. Yeah, and then yeah, I called the guy up, told him I wanted to work for free, just wanted to learn, you know, wanted to learn how to invest in real estate. Yeah, he was kind of an older guy that was retiring, and I think that, you know, what I've found in this business, man, is that when we find people that kind of inspire us and uh, they kind of give us that that feeling of what we had when we first started, it makes you want to pour into them and and see them be successful. Yeah. No. Yeah, I get that too. I mean. Um, I mean, I'm only two years in, but when people come reach out to me and want, for, want to get into even just wholesale, I'm like, uh, it's hard for me to say no, because I remember being in that position and having troubles finding people to to look up to or not to look up exactly. to, but to get, to get uh, some sort of mentorship from. Um, so, yeah, I feel you on that one. Um, so you got in just a smidge before the crash. Uh, what was your first strategy and, and kind of why did you choose it? So, ironically, my first strategy was wholesaling. I was a broke uh, college dropout who just had a kid. 
I was trying to get life figured out, didn't really know what I was going to do. And uh, I was working a job at T-Mobile part-time. So I kind of came across the strategy of wholesaling. I implemented that pretty early. Uh, and then really shortly after I started wholesaling, I uh, found out about the short sale niche. So I started doing a lot of short sales. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I started doing those, uh, we had a lot of success with that. I uh, partnered up with another guy in my market at the time. And uh, we started really crushing it with, with the short sales, which, you know, back then, this is like 08, 09, 2010. Uh, I mean, the market was plentiful with short sale opportunities, you know. Uh, so we kind of segued into that first. Awesome. And so when I first met you, it's been about uh, a little bit over a year now. Uh, you were doing a lot of building, a lot of rehabbing. So what brought you from the wholesaling to uh, the building, the rehabbing? Because your bills are pretty, I mean, they're pretty extravagant. They weren't cheap houses from where I remember. Um, right. So what, what made you get into that? Uh, you know, I always had a, a, a life of, you know, building and, uh, you know, design, things of that nature. And, uh, you know, I'm one of those people, man, I just kind of follow the market. I follow what what opportunities are available to me inside the market. Uh, You know, I don't I don't feel like I stick to one model per se. So uh, we were doing a lot of renovations, a lot of cosmetic renovations. And back in 2012, I was picking up a house uh, downtown in the city of Richmond that uh, when you walked into it, like you could see the sky, like there was no roof on it, that kind of thing. And I was picking it up originally to rehab it. And it would have been my biggest rehab ever at the time. And my contractor, he says, hey, man, why don't you build a house? Like, why don't you just tear it down and build a house? And I'm like, hey, I'm like, you know, I don't know anything about building a house, you know, da 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 And he's like, look, it's not complicated. You know, it's really a kind of assistance process kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I can help you figure it out. So I ended up cold calling another local builder, taking him to lunch. I ended up paying him to coach me on how to build a house guy named Ricky Scott and uh, he, he was able to teach me how to build a house and uh, what I found after I did that first one this is when the market first started to, to kind of rebound yeah and what I started to see was that the market was starting to get uh, you know kind of restricted in the sense a lot of people were starting to enter the market as investors and what I saw is that nobody was doing infill lots nobody was buying infill lots uh, and building uh, you know infill inventory Mm-hmm. So when I saw that I couldn't just go on MLS and buy three or four houses anymore, that they were starting to bidding wars, prices were going up, we changed our focus and started focusing on infill lots, and uh, that's kind of how we transitioned into doing new construction. Yep, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so uh, I, I, I can imagine the first thing that somebody says to you, well, well, when you got in the building, what were your struggles? it's gotta be the money aspect because not many lenders are going to, to just cop up, you know, a few hundred grand for you to start building something when all the only backing, uh, the only collateral they have is the yeah. land. So right. you had your private money connections at that point. Yeah. So I had established some really good private money connections at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had one guy in particular who kind of really saw the vision, saw what I was trying to accomplish. And uh, he's kind of a, an edgy guy in the sense that he likes to kind of push the envelope and do some stuff that's different. So I kind of outlaid for him what I was looking to do, what I saw was available to do on the market, specifically in this one neighborhood. And uh, he supported that. Uh, we went out and we picked up a bunch of different lots. Um, we kind of structured it where, and this is really helpful to me, we saw that the market was appreciating uh, pretty rapidly at the time. So what we were able to do was uh, I was able to borrow the money to buy the dirt right and then also get a commitment for the money to build the property but he didn't escrow the money to build the property Mm -hmm. so i wasn't paying i didn't have to pay interest on uh you know the construction money the entire time we were trying to figure out plans you know zoning you know all these different things yeah Uh, so he kind of gave me the freedom and flexibility to kind of step into the role of building houses and stuff like that man that's awesome yeah, now I did have a bunch of lenders that I took the idea to uh, who couldn't see the vision, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, they said, hey, look, you know, the money's not worth real much, you know, a lot to me. It's just it's just dirt, right? Which I can yeah. understand that. Um, and that's why I think it's important, man, when it comes to private money or hard money, it's, you really got to get with somebody that kind of sees your vision yeah. uh, and sees what you're trying to accomplish. At that time, I didn't have, 
but you know, I, I was young. I was really young at the time, you know, like 20, 23, 22, right? Um, but I'd done a, a good a number of rehabs. None of them were big rehabs, but we had kind of shown that, you know, we could get stuff done. We could find deals. And we've always done our own marketing in-house, even when we weren't wholesaling. Yep. And that's given us the benefit of buying stuff really cheap. Uh, so our LTVs have really been, uh, you know, uh, pretty low and, and positive on our end. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So before here, before our conversation, you said you had, um, you were typically doing between 20 and 30 new builds in rehabs. Is there a method you preferred? Um, rehab versus new construction because in my world i don't ever want to touch rehab again if i don't have to <laughs> but um yeah I, I am having to unfortunately but uh you know you know my buddy matt peace he's building yeah, yeah, yeah. he doesn't do any rehabs he, he you know like me we, we hate the rehabs because there's always something that was unexpe- unexpected except in new builds it's kind of yeah. cookie cutter in a sense yeah, man. So, like, for, for me, right, like, I enjoy doing renovations. Uh, it just got to the point where it became so tedious, and it just became a frustration point. You know, I prefer doing new construction. It's like putting a puzzle together. Yep. Really enjoy doing new construction. You can really make some really nice houses. Um, if you can get land on the cheap, you know, you can really make some really good spreads. New construction is not without its struggles, right? We've had plenty of those. Uh, but new construction, by far... I would do over a rehab any day of the week. I've, I've got rehabs right now. Um, we've kind of stepped out of the new construction model in the last 12 months. Uh, so I've still got some rehabs, but we're not doing any big rehabs anymore. Everything we've got is like $40,000 and under budget. Where at one time, any rehab we had was a budget of 100000 or more uh, on top of all the new construction projects we had. So, um, you know, yeah, so talk about stress and kind of being all over the place and yeah. dealing with that. That's nuts. I, I don't think I've ever done a, a rehab that big. Uh, I think my biggest rehab budget was like 65000 or something. And that was just a big house yeah. that had the basic cosmetics done to it. And couldn't imagine a 100K house. That's awesome, man. I had, at, at the peak, I think we had like 22 going at, at one time. It was, it was nuts, man. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Um, so you've been at 10 years. You went from wholesaling, building and rehabbing to now you told me you're getting back into wholesaling um, and, and you're loving it. It sounds like so. Uh, Can't complain, man. I love it. Yeah. It's a totally different business. Now you're, you're a marketing company in a sense. So um, have you always been marketing or, or was it a new thing you had to learn? No. So the cool part for us is, Thankfully, man, and, and I wish I would have never stopped wholesaling, uh, but thankfully, we had always done our own marketing. So, like when I talked earlier about how the market started to restrict and, you know, you couldn't just go on MLS and get deals like you could in years past, we always kept our marketing systems in place. We always stayed up to date uh, with, you know, the newest marketing techniques, things of that nature. So, we always did our own marketing and produced our own deals. So it made it very easy when we decided to kind of transition back into wholesaling. It made it really, really simple to kind of make that adjustment. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I believe in wholesaling 110%. You know, some of the spreads that we're making on our deals are more than we made uh, when we were renovating and rehabbing properties. Uh, you know, it's a lot less stressful. You know, we don't have to talk to contractors all day, every day anymore, worry about guys not showing up, uh, worrying about guys taking our money and things of that nature. Uh, so it's been it's, it's been a really cool uh, transition. It's been fun. I do tell people now that really what our business is is it's, it's a sales and marketing business is, yeah. is what it is. It's not a construction company. It's not a you know renovation company, house flipping company, that kind of thing. While we do do renovations, the core of our entire business extremely dependent on sales and marketing. And so we our our entire focus is specific to how to improve our systems, how to improve our processes, uh, how to be better at sales, uh, how to be better at our cold and direct marketing, things of that nature. So I'm really having fun with it, man. Um, you know, uh, when you're doing that many rehabs and that many new builds, you don't realize, you know, kind of what it takes out of you in terms of time, energy, 
uh, the level of stress I remember that I was running for so long. Uh, it's kind of like all of that's now gone. And it's, it's kind of almost like I got back to having fun with it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. You know, when I first started doing this out of, out of college or when I dropped out of college, I mean, it was exciting. It was fun. You know, I woke up every day, like, ready to kill it and take on the world. Then you kind of get into that space where your business gets so big and you got so much stuff going on that, you know, it kind of became a job at one point. Um, got really stressful. We went through some cash flow issues back in 2017. That was a result of we had so many projects going at one time that we were burning through over $200,000 a month just to keep everything moving, you know? Mm-hmm. And so uh, wholesaling really kind of came in and we, we actually started back wholesaling, by the way, uh, because of the cash flow issues, right? Uh, and we because we needed to kind of spur up some cash and be able to move our projects along. So that's what made us start wholesaling again. And then we started realizing, like, well, shit, wait a minute. You know, we're making thirty, forty, fifty thousand a pop. We've done some wholesale deals. We've made a hundred thousand, seventy-two thousand. So we really just kind of took a look, took a look at it and said, well, wait a second, how the hell are we building a house to make? 70 grand if we can wholesale a house and make 70 grand um so we just started shipping the business model out i'm gonna have to move out to richmond and become part of the mafia because you don't <laughs> you don't get those kind of wholesales too often out here anymore holy crap we're in, we're in an interesting market here um you know our wholesale business is a little different than most i'll definitely say that so we do a lot of wholesale deals i don't know if you're familiar with that yeah um but you know, I'd say majority of our deals are wholesale deals. So, for example, I've got one closed in a day. Bought the property for one hundred sixty thousand. Uh, listed on the MLS for two hundred nineteen thousand, and within two weeks, I sold it for two ten. So that's closed in a day. We didn't do any work to that. Uh, literally, all we did was turn the utilities on. Um, one thing I realized, man, is that, and you said it earlier. So, like the houses we renovated, the houses we built were mostly high end. Uh, inside of the city. And so we were always the person that was pushing the price point, pushing the the top of the market, doing the HGTV thing and all of that. Yeah. And it was gorgeous. We built beautiful houses. I enjoyed doing that. What I realized though, is like if you look at comps in your market where you see these kind of rehabs, uh, what we found out was that well, there's a bunch of people that are buying regular houses that you know aren't fancy and have the latest grays and cool kitchens and baths and all that. There's a bunch of houses selling that are going to owner occupants that don't have anything special at all. Yeah. And we just we kind of just shifted into appealing to that market. Yeah. No, I mean that's what I've been doing um, by default on every single house is I'll uh, put on the MLS for a week or two and just let it sit. I mean it's like I don't know 500 bucks in holding costs depending on the the house, but um, if you can go make uh, 20, 30, 40 in 45 days versus 20, 30, 40 in 90 to 150. Why, why not? Right. Or even a fraction of it. Oh, yeah. It's all about the revolution and of the capital. So um, I Absolutely, love that model. Man. Our lenders, uh, our lenders like it better. Um, you know, we've got more velocity of capital mm-hmm. at, at this point. You know, it used to take us six, 12, 18 months to be able to turn a project. Yeah. Whereas now we're turning stuff in less than 60 days. Um, so our, our lenders are enjoying that. I'm obviously enjoying that. And what you realize is kind of simple, really, man. Once you start doing more simple deals, then it just comes about uh, being able to compound that profit and that revenue, right? So yeah. the time and energy and resource it takes to build one house, you know, is minuscule or is huge. But the wholesale, the ability to do a wholesale is minuscule when you compare it to that. The point is you want to compound it, right? So like if you make 20 grand, but instead of it taking you six months, it takes you less than 30 days. And now you've got all this additional time back. Yeah. Well, even if you make 10 grand, if you do 10 deals in a month and make 10 grand, it's 100 grand in a month. Yeah. Right. Um, And so we've kind of just shifted philosophies uh, into that belief versus uh, doing one build to make 100 grand. Yeah, no, I hear you. And I, I was the idiot on Facebook a couple months ago putting, I'll buy any house, no matter how bad the house is, how big the rehab <laughs> is. And I, and I posted, I'm like, what the hell am I doing? I'm just asking for an ass whooping in this. So I'm like, no doubt, man. No doubt, dude. 
Yeah, when you get you get your ass kicked a few times, man, with these houses, uh, you start thinking a little different, man. I, I used to be that guy, man. I, I bought if a deal came up, I bought every single one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I remember I remember guys joking that I was a, a house hoarder because uh, I, I seem to always be buying a bunch of houses, and yeah. even if we weren't even able or ready to start working on it, we'd buy it and sit on it. Yeah. Uh, so thankfully, we went through those phases as the market was appreciating. So the appreciation in the market allowed us to kind of mess, make some mistakes, mess some stuff up, yeah. and uh, you know, thankfully, still be able to get it figured out. Um, so you know, we've we've had that benefit for sure. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, I've only been doing it two years, but in this two years, I've ridden all the emotional and financial trains there are <laughs> for roller coasters. Oh man. And, uh, um man first year we did pretty good last year it seemed like every deal is a home run then this year it's like holy crap i don't know what what avenue i turned down but i need to turn this shit around and go so but hey, dude I've, I've i've been there man i've, yeah. I've been there the, the, the thing i tell people man is like you know when we had we had a couple like we had a tough year tough year and a half really kind of starting back in, in 2017 and but going through those issues and those pains and things of that nature were critical for us to kind of get to the spot that we're in right now. Had we not dealt with those, I'd probably still be building a bunch of houses. I'd probably still be over leveraged into the market. Um, you know, so my belief now is, man, everything happens for a reason. Um, you know, patience is a virtue for sure. And uh, kind of got to embrace the lumps, man. It's, this business can take the wind out of you, man. Um, yeah. You know, right before I got on the call with you, I got a deal that was supposed to close on Friday. I get a call, hey, no, it's not closing. There's a title issue, da 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 da. And so it's, you know, like I used to get upset about that kind of stuff if you've been out of shape. But it's like, all right, like, right, we'll just put it back in the funnel. We'll work through the title issues. It'll drop when it drops. And let's keep working. Yep. Yep. Same deal. It seems like a past four or five have had, had some sort of title. Um, or yeah, some something that delays the closing. It's never it's never on time. But that's just yeah, nothing smooth. Part of the deal. Um, no doubt, man. Uh, so you've concentrated primarily on, on wholesaling, and like we discussed, it's it's a uh, it's basically a marketing business. Um, right. Without spilling all the beans, what would you say has been uh, one of your best avenues, whether it's direct mail, cold call? Like we were talking before, like I'm, I'm doing mass texting in, in emails and RVM. Um, is there any one niche that works better for you? You know, better KPIs? Yeah, or man. Otherwise? So right now for us, uh, you know, cold calling and texting and RVM uh, by far have, have exploded our business. You know, we started cold calling about three years ago. Yeah. Uh, when we started, it was, not a lot of people were doing it at the time. It was completely transformative to the to the business and kind of leads that we brought in. We still do a lot of cold calling now. Uh, we do a lot of RVMs. Our RVMs are specific to follow ups. I know a lot of people do it for their initial cold uh, cold call contacts. We don't. Uh, we only use it for follow up. That may change, but uh, it works pretty well. We have it set up right now, and uh, I'm enjoying text as well, man. Text has been great. Uh, we get a really great return from text. Mm-hmm. You know, go straight to the person's phone. Um, you know, we, we work in volume. So I like spending money uh, on my marketing and, and having value in what I'm doing. And, you know, texting and cold calling is 110% uh, been extremely beneficial for sure. Yeah. Um, and are you finding that's better? Because uh, in DFW, like I told you uh, while we were on that cruise, I've gotten out of foreclosure marketing altogether just because there's so many people doing it and it becomes one of those battles that I just don't want to deal with. Um, is there a specific niche that's working for you or have been for the past three years or have you had to change niches um, since then? Yeah. So we, we've changed niches a lot. Um, so, but I'll tell you what I've been doing in the last six months is working really well. So what I've started doing is Thinking as th- thinking of things as the actual buyer. I've been a buyer for years. I still buy. And so I had to realize that I needed to start thinking about exactly what I wanted in a property and start appealing out specifically to that. Yeah. So to get, put that in perspective, uh, so I made a list 
uh, back in uh, March, okay? And the list only has 2,100 names on it or records on it. And uh, we just sold our, like this week, we just sold our ninth deal uh, on that list, right? And it's only 2,100 records or so. Wow. What we did is we went and looked at the market and said, you know, hey, where's the highest concentration of cash sales, right? Which everybody tells you to do that. But what happens is we needed to kind of narrow that down into a real niche list. And so we built out specific parameters uh, to build out that list. I'm not going to tell that specifically, but I'm going to give you an yeah. example. All okay. right. So, for example, if I know in my market that, you know, the average assessed value of each house, that if I look back at all my leads and all my deals for the past 12 months, and I look and I realize that, all right, hey, look, well, you know, all of our deals came from properties assessed under, let's say, $95,000, right? Between seventy five dollars and $95,000, right? So you want to go build out a list kind of specific to that you know is the hottest deals in your market that you make the most profit on is that a three one right so in my market i know that that's a three one so i want to build out a list that specifically just has maybe you know 75 to 95 tax assessed value and they're all three ones right so instead of making these right wide range lists we started to kind of really kind of condense and narrow that down to build out our own niche list yeah that's worked out really well uh especially absentee uh, we do some owner occupant. I always tell people to do owner occupant as a supplemental list. I think if your marketing dollars are limited, that you shouldn't uh, make your only list an uh, owner occupant list. I think it takes a certain skill set to be able to talk to somebody about moving out of the house they live in. Yeah. Uh, and I also don't think those are quick leads. I think those are generally going to be, you know, follow up leads over time. Yeah. Um, pro probate has been really good to us. Um, our two best kind of big lists per se have been tax delinquents and code violations. Yep. Um, we've, had, we've had a lot of success with that in the last couple of years. And in my opinion, I think what that is, is that like the way those lists are formatted from our, our city and counties here is they don't give you the actual address, right? So they only give you like the parcel ID. So we've been able to develop some bots uh, and hire some people to build some bots for us. And so those bots can extract out that data for us where it used to take a VA, you know, a few months to go through a list of 20,000 people and filter that down and pull data out, things of that nature. Now we have, for example, we have a buy. They can take the parcel ID, take it to the county website, pull all the pertinent information, put it into a new spreadsheet to skip trace ready. And we can do that within a week, right? Yeah. Um, so those type of lists uh, have worked really well because what I've found, man, is, and I've been guilty of this too, so I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. What I've found is most wholesalers, and even most successful wholesalers, uh, don't want to spend money on marketing, right? And so what happens is, you do a deal, you make 20 grand, you're like, oh, all right, well, my marketing budget's going to be $1,000 this month. Yeah. Like, right nah, man, your marketing budget should really be like 10 grand, right? And so we've just been intentional here recently, and I've I made this mistake before is why I'm saying it. In the last six to eight months, we've been really intentional about putting a lot of money back into our marketing. And that's really been proven dividends in terms of uh, the volume of deals that we've been able to do. You know, before this, we were doing like two to four deals a month. Yeah. Right now, we're doing six to eight, close to 10, uh, just by kind of going a little bit heavier on the marketing, getting more specific with our list, uh, things of that nature. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I've been on one of those. Um, because you know, you see me out there. I'm, I like traveling. I like traveling more than I like working. Unfortunately, I like I like working because <laughs> I'm a hard worker. But I'd prefer to go traveling. And so I'm always in that dance with myself of should I put more money into marketing or should I put more time into branding? And then I'm like, no, it's dumb. I need to go put more money in marketing. I'm like, that's retarded. I'm spending money now. I need to go put more time in branding. I'm like, so I'm always in that battle of. Do, do I build the name to bring leads or do I sp spend the money to bring leads? And I can never figure it yeah. out. <laughs> it, 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 it's tough, man. I don't know if there's any right answer. You know, yeah. like I, so we've got a brand now that, that produces leads, brings in leads for us. We do a lot of JV deals in our market. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's, still, it's still a tough struggle, man. We might have four or five JV deals coming in a month. Um, 
But right now, I'm still trying to make that core focus um, on marketing and spending marketing dollars. I'm kind of guilty of the same thing. You know, I like enjoying myself, man. And, mm. you know, after you do all those damn rehabs for so long, man, you kind of need some time to, to take a break and relax. So I'm guilty of the same thing. Uh, the team building part has been big for me. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, building out a team, uh, having people that can get things accomplished. You know, we were in Cuba together. Um, and I was gone for uh, essentially two weeks. I, I came back for three days, but I didn't work. And I left to go on another trip. And uh, nobody dropped the ball while I was gone. Everything was still getting done. You know, so kind of building that team out has been super critical and uh, extremely helpful as well. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Um, I think at one point you mentioned uh, apartments way back when. I probably saw it on Facebook or something. Are you into the in, uh, commercial space at all? Or we're trying to get yeah, into so that? We've got, so we've got an apartment deal that we're doing uh, with a couple other guys here in town. Uh, that is a uh, apartment development, 23 unit. Uh, so that should be done actually in September. Nice. So that's kind of been its own beast. Uh, that's been an interesting project, a lot of learning lessons. It'll still be an extremely profitable project, thankfully. Yeah. Um, my, my opinion on the apartment space has changed. You know, I'm still interested in apartments. Uh, I think a lot of people are overpaying for units right now. Yeah. Uh, it's not really of interest to me. Um, and one thing that I had to do, and, you know, I'm sure you probably had this thought process before. <laughs> Excuse me. Man, sometimes I forget I'm 32. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what I mean by that is, you know, we want to do like all this shit. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we've got peers. You and I got a lot of mutual people that we know. Right. But a lot of these guys, man, they're 20, 30 years older than we are. Right. Yeah. And what I've, what I've learned is that we don't, I don't have to have the same thought process and course perspective uh, as they do um, to have any success. Right. So, you know, somebody I know that's 58, for example, he might really need an apartment deal at a five cap or a six cap right now. Right. Yeah. Uh, but he's 50, he's 58. Right. He wants the money coming in every month. He wants to be able to retire, that kind of thing. I'm 32. I'm still going to be active and do some different things. So my restriction might be a six and a half cap. Maybe it's not a five cap. Yeah. So my thought process has got to come back to, I think there'll be some change in the market at some point. When that is, I, have, I literally have no idea anymore. Two years ago, we thought it was going to be then. Yeah. Uh, two years ago, we thought it was going to be now, that kind of thing. So I don't know. Uh, my goal has been to get lean and mean, not carry as much debt. Uh, you know, and that comes from not doing those big rehabs, not doing the new construction, yeah. selling off some land. The also part of our business uh, is extremely intentional, right? Uh, our intent is to uh, get as much cash together and get our cash up as much as possible. Uh, build a lot of really strong, solid lender relationships. Uh, you know, some of the groups that we're in uh, together uh, have been great uh, from a lending perspective for us. Uh, we've met some really great lenders. When that market adjustment does happen, uh, we want to be in a liquidity position uh, that it can be a really strong strike point for us. So we can go in then and get the apartment deals that we want. We can go in and pick up the single family portfolios that we want. Right now, it's more of a Hey, let's kind of like let's line the war chest up uh, and and be ready. So when that does come, we can immediately go. Because I, I remember what it was like in 2010. And I remember I was again I was just getting into the business, but I remember there was so much opportunity everywhere. And I remember thinking, man, if I only had more money at my disposal to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. Yeah. So I don't. Whenever that next opportunity comes up, I don't want to miss that. Because that's the one that's going to set me up to be able to, you know, like you go buy a plane or, you know, <laughs> get a Ferrari, you know, that kind of thing, man. So yeah. I'm patiently uh, waiting on on that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, uh, without going too much further, uh, I'd like to hear a little more about the apartment. So 23 units, you're building it. It's a development. So we shelled it. So we gutted it out. 23 existing units. Uh, we bought it for right around 1.3. Um, got four partners in it. And uh, we came in, uh, the original plan, right, was to do four units at a time. Yeah. All right. Uh, and, and what ended up happening is a low-income building 
We want to do four units at a time. Everybody was essentially kind of a month to month, that kind of deal. As we started construction, everybody stopped paying. You know, essentially it became an empty building uh, really quickly, right? Jeez. And as a result, yeah, so it kind of blew our plan up, right? Because our yeah. plan was to use the cash flow uh, from the existing tenants to work through the construction, pay the debt service, things of that nature. Um, so everybody moves out within like 90 days. We got zero cash coming in. Uh, we're sitting around like, shit, like, right, we got a $2 million loan, personally guaranteed it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, got to figure this out, right? Yeah. Uh, so we had to be resourceful. Uh, it was a bunch of headaches. Uh, we were able to kind of raise some equity, raise some debt, and uh, bring some people into the deal uh, that could help supplement us through uh, getting that done. It took, it, it, was, it took us probably six, eight months, man, to even kind of get all that figured out and get it on the right track. Uh, we're dealing with a local bank here, uh, Union Bank, who's been phenomenal. Um, they've been, they've gone, our bankers gone literally above and beyond uh, in supporting and seeing the project and uh, kind of seeing it through. Um, and so it, it's been awesome, man. At the end of the day, uh, it'll be cool because we'll plan to refinance it in September, right? Yeah. So within, within two years, uh, we'll get all of our initial capital back. Our investors will get all their capital back. Uh, and so then eventually, I mean, at that point, we're essentially in the deal for an infinity return. Yeah. Uh, apartments are really cool because it's the same concept as single family investments in terms of, uh, you know, the birth strategy, right? Yeah. It's essentially the birth, birth strategy on a bigger scale. So it's cool because single family, uh, you're limited in the velocity that you could work in because you have to do so many transactions right. to make money. You know, this is essentially doing 23 single family units at one time. Right. Um, so I do enjoy that. I think apartments are great. Like I said, we're just waiting for the right time to kind of jump back into that. Yeah. Uh, on our yeah. Right. Well, if you, if you found one that needed all 23 units, you probably got it at a, at a great deal, which, you know, sure. uh, is why you would wait for the market to drop for a really good deal. So um, uh, that's a really good move there. Uh, are you, you, play, you say you're a refi, so you're keeping it. Is there a five-year, 10-year plan or just, eh, we'll see where it goes? Yeah, so I think we're kind of really playing it by ear. So we bought it in a, in a market uh, that I've got a large presence in, our neighborhood rather, I have a large presence in over the years. And it's a uh, it's one of the hottest neighborhoods, if not the hottest neighborhood in Richmond right now. Has been for a really long time. It was the number one neighborhood in the country by USA Today at one point. And it kind of was right on the outskirt of the neighborhood, like right on the edge of the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a grocery store right across the street that I think at some point will so it's kind of a mom and pop grocery store right now. I think at some point a larger chain retailer will come in and pick that up and turn it into a, a larger grocer. So we haven't really decided. It's more planning by year. Like I said, the benefit is we cash out, get an infinity return. We bought it well. Um, you know, the idea originally was hey, this is something I can buy and hold on to forever mm-hmm. and get a really good monthly return on. That's still the same, uh, but if there's an opportunity to sell it and flip it and make a really good opportunity, I would do that too. Uh, the reason I would do that is because I would structure that deal differently if I was to do it again. So the way that it was structured originally is that, like I said, I've got four partners, so these are multiple general partners. Yeah. Um, we would, I, would, I would use a syndication model uh, if I was to do it again. So uh, by being in the financial group, we're in the concept of raising the money that we needed to raise to do that deal at the time was a very uh, daunting task, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we had to come up with a lot of cash to be able to do this deal. Uh, now, you know, uh, through some great networking, the concept of coming up with that cash doesn't seem difficult, right? It, it seems like doing a, a regular deal, really, right? So we would structure that as a syndication and kind of have full control of the deal yep. uh, and, and be the, the, the full operator uh, versus, you know, when you have people and you got multiple people that got to make decisions, uh, things of that nature, um, you know, regardless of how cool you guys are, things of that nature, there's always going to be different plans of action that people have a perspective. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely learned that the hard way here recently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't want to take up uh, your whole day, but you recently started uh, with, I believe, your partners, a, uh, a program called Lion's Den. Tell us a little, little bit about that. 
Yeah, man. So Lions Den is really cool. So I've got a guy uh, in my market, a guy named Eric Hunter, who I started mentoring him um, kind of loosely like six years ago. Uh, he reached out to me, kind of cold called me. <laughs> he kind of blew me up for a couple of months. We finally got lunch. And uh, we got lunch. He kind of just struck me as a guy. We're the same age, but I had been in the business for a while. I had a lot of success. And he really kind of struck me as somebody like me, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And uh, he just kind of had that, that in factor, you know. Uh, so I wanted to pour into him. He's done phenomenal. He's a wholesaler. He's been killing it. So back in December, he came to me. Uh, November, December, he came to me and he said, hey, man, you know, you changed my life. You put me into this business, but I don't really see you that much. We don't spend a lot of time together. And uh, I kind of thought about it when he said it. And I was just like, damn, man, like, you know, that's a really good point. I can kind of isolate myself sometimes and not spend a lot of time with people uh, that I may care about or have relationships with. Uh, I can be too in tune in my business or family, stuff like that. And uh, sometimes I kind of forget the network, if that makes any sense. And um, so he said, hey, man, like, you know, what can we do together to change some people's lives the way that you changed my life? I never really thought about coaching or uh, doing anything of that nature, to be honest. And um, he kind of put that in front of me, man. So we reached out to some people that we knew in the market and we set up a dinner. And I think we had like 13 people show. We went to Morton Steakhouse, uh, had a dinner of 13 guys. There were wholesalers in town. And uh, we just asked, like, hey, how can we help you guys be better, right? Uh, what what did we know? Um, could we assist you guys with to, to make you achieve your goals? And it was never a competition thing. So we started this locally with guys in our market. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was never like a competition kind of thing. It's, I saw the benefit of what if all the wholesalers in the city collaborated and worked together? Yeah. Like how powerful could that actually be, right? Um, because what you start to realize is it's really the wholesaler who controls the market. It's not the, it's not the rehabber. It's not the landlord, it's not those guys, because they don't have any deals that the wholesaler is not there. Right. Right. These guys don't have marketing systems. They don't do these things. So we tried to build that collective. It's been awesome. We've got 47 or 48 people in the group now. Um, it's a weekly coaching call. It's a private Facebook group where we give out a ton of different information. Uh, We've got people now uh, in different states that have kind of joined. We haven't done any marketing for this. Uh, We don't have like a YouTube or Facebook ads right now or anything. It's just really all been organic. Uh, People who have reached out to us that really kind of say that they want to make that level of commitment uh, to do wholesaling. We charge $197 a month uh, for that. You know, we'll help fund your deals. Uh, We'll coach you through your deals, things of that nature. Mm-hmm. So it's been cool, man. Like, I, you know, people helped me when I got started in this business. And, uh, you know, I'm able to do things now that I never imagined really being able to do. Uh, it's given me, despite all the bullshit and hard times and roller coaster ride of, of doing this, uh, I've been blessed and I've had really good opportunities in my life. So if I can help other people uh, see the same thing, uh, you know, I'm inclined to want to be able to do that right now and wholesaling more and rehabbing less has given me the time to pour into other people mm-hmm. and uh, try to help them out as well. Yeah, man, that's awesome. That's great. Great business model. And it's a great to give back um, when um, entrepreneurs like us have been so blessed to, to have these opportunities. Uh, it's kind of cool helping a lot of people. I mean, uh, it's a feel good feeling. So uh, it's awesome, man. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Um, uh, again, don't want to take up too much time. So where can people reach out to you if they got questions uh, about anything we discussed or the lion's den? Yeah, man. So the best way to reach me is, uh, email. So that's Chris, C-H-R-I-S at Ridge, R-I-D-G-E point P-O-I-N-T R-E.com. So Chris at Ridge point R-E.com. Yeah. Or you can yeah. find, find me on Facebook or Instagram at living fresh so living fresh uh, on uh, on social media and uh you know if anybody's hoping to reach out to me and uh, if you got a question i'll do my best to answer it if i don't know the answer i'm happy to point in the right direction as well well it sounds like somebody's walked into your room there in the hotel so <laughs> well i'm at the uh i'm sitting outside here by the pool yeah and uh, there's this kid this kid over here under the fountain who's uh 
who's yelling and screaming, man. So I'm kind of tripping off of him a little bit. Yeah. Uh, no, but he's, uh, he's having a good time. No big deal. Yeah. Uh, and it, that was bound to happen. I knew you were out there. So um, all good, man. <laughs> yeah. uh, I appreciate you coming on sharing your knowledge. And uh, uh, I don't know if any other financial friends cruise I'm going on anytime soon, but uh, maybe I'll head out to Richmond. Yeah, let me know, man. And uh, are you going to uh, Quest Expo? Oh, uh, probably. That's in August, yeah. All right. So I'll like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be there, man. Cool. All right, for sure, man. All right, All right. I appreciate you, man. Keep doing your thing, man. I'm, I'm loving the movement, uh, the whole thing that you got going on, man. You're uh, motivating and inspiring people, and you got some good guests on here, man, that are dropping a lot of really good gems, man. So I'm going to continue to support you, and uh, look forward to seeing your success, man. Appreciate it, man. <laughs> cool. All right. All right. Later. All right, brother. I'll see you.